Coming up this hour, are a growing number of scholars in agreement that Jesus is a myth? I'll talk it over with Dr. James White from Alpha and Omega Ministries. Portions of this hour are brought to you by StopHamasNow.com. Stand with Israel. Go to StopHamasNow.com and join us for this hour of the Janet Mefford Show. The Janet Mefford Show. The great thing about the Bible is it never evolves. What's immoral about getting married? Gay, straight, everybody wants that. Don't discard the time-tested values upon which civilization was built simply because they're old. There are many paths to what you call God. It's so simple. Maybe you need a refresher course. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If the Word of God says it, I believe it. (laughs) That's the way it is. And now, here is Janet Mefford. Well, it is great to be with you. Thanks so much for joining us. In recent years, we have seen a number of writers attack biblical orthodoxy. This has gone on for quite a while, of course. But in recent years, we've seen the works of Dr. Bart Ehrman, for example, who's authored a number of books attacking the Bible, attacking biblical truth, including the books Forged and Misquoting Jesus and How Jesus Became God. And then we've also seen some books that attack Jesus and his very existence. We have the book Zealot by Muslim Reza Aslan, and we've had this book by atheist activist David Fitzgerald called Nailed, Ten Christian Myths that Show Jesus Never Existed at All. And now some of the recent reports coming out are indicating a growing number of legitimate scholars believe there actually never was a Jesus, which is just astonishing to me. But we're going to talk about it today with Dr. James White, who is director of Alpha and Omega Ministries, a Christian apologetics organization based in Phoenix, and the author of more than 20 books, including his latest, What Every Christian Needs to Know About the Koran. And it's just a delight to welcome Dr. White back. How are you today? I'm doing pretty well. I, I managed to swim into the office here. I was going to say, I thought of you today. I was looking at the Drudge Report, and I said, he's probably in a boat somewhere, but as long as he's got a life jacket, we're probably still getting a <laughs> cell phone. We're probably still good. Yeah, we, we haven't had this much rain in Phoenix in 75 years. So, oh, wow. Uh, that's, um, that's pretty impressive, but we needed it. Yes. Uh, that's what we keep saying anyways. But, Absolutely. Uh, good, good, good. Glad you're okay. Well, yes. why is it we're seeing this uptick in people, scholars claiming that Jesus didn't exist? Um, the internet and a society in a complete moral and ethical meltdown, uh, because nothing... Nothing has changed as far as historical studies or anything. In fact, the irony uh, is that uh, one of the more recent Bart Ehrman books uh, was debunking this whole thing. Mm. Um, he's always been one that has sort of said, uh, these, we, we call them mythers. Uh, these, these mythers, there aren't any serious historians amongst them. And uh, so he wrote a book, um, and it was a, it was a backhanded slap at the orthodox view of Jesus, but in the process, he said, there there isn't any question that there was a Galilean preacher named Jesus. I mean, (laughs) no one can seriously doubt that, which is what made reading this uh, Nailed book uh, so interesting was, uh, I, I... now that I think about it, I may have heard something about it when it first came out, but it's a it's a self-published book, and, uh, you know, uh, you all had called, and so you know me, I, I decided to uh, go for a bike ride and read a book. So uh, Oh, that's safe. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, uh, I'm not sure the bike riding is, but uh, that's, that's how I get through stuff, and yeah. so I, you know, bought the book on Kindle and recorded it and listened to it, and, and I'm, I'm just almost chuckling at times. It was, it was just so bad yeah. uh, on just so many levels, just from any historical perspective at all. And, and, as, and especially when you started dealing with textual criticism and stuff, it was just so amateurish. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm coming back going, well, okay, if this is a new book, then why didn't he deal with Ehrman? I mean, he quotes Ehrman, but he doesn't quote Ehrman's book on the existence of Jesus. And and I said, you know, I just have a gut feeling, given the sources he used, uh, that this guy is some radical atheist someplace. <laughs> and I get back, and, of course, I look on the Internet, and guess what? <laughs> yeah, he's uh, the head of San, Fr- San Francisco atheists. It's one thing to be an atheist, but it's even worse to be an atheist <laughs> from San Francisco. I mean, yeah. you put all that together, it's pretty bad. So, But the, the thing is, you know, we can sort of chuckle, and we'll look at some of the specifics, uh, because we all need to, unfortunately, know what's, what's out there. But when you ask, is there really a growing, is there a consensus, is there a movement, um, not among serious scholars, but um, look, if, if the state of California 
can kick all of inter, of uh, university Christian fellowship uh, out of the university system simply for being Christians. Yeah. Um, what what would hold that kind of quote unquote academic uh, context back from just throwing all the canons of historiography out the window and uh, promoting this kind of thing? That's nothing, true. nothing yeah. at all. So. It's a society that is in in absolute uh, meltdown when it comes to being in rebellion against God's truth. And uh, this is a very convenient way to do it. I mean, you don't have to worry about what Jesus taught if he never existed. That's right. You don't have to interact with anything. And, and I thought it was interesting when you mentioned that you discovered it. I, I suffered through the same book yesterday, so we can talk about it in detail. But <laughs> I said, when I looked at his bio and I said the head of Evolution Palooza <laughs> in San Francisco is, is debunking Jesus' historicity, I mean, right. does this guy really have the chops to even delve into this? Well, you know, uh, the, the Internet creates um, uh, the internet has created. Well, in, in fact, I don't know if you if you found it, but uh, I was directed via Twitter, uh, which sometimes amazingly does good things. Um, I was directed to a fascinating review of the book by an atheist. Oh wow! Um, that ripped it to shreds. I mean, it used language that you and I can't use in our context. Oh, um, but it basically said, this is a load of hooey. This is horrible. Uh, this is just, just... So, it's not just Christians who have said, hmm, this is bad, but uh, atheists have uh, done the same thing. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to get into more on this from Dr. James White when we discuss this idea that a growing number of scholars believe there never was a Jesus. We'll get back to it after this. Stay with us. Is it the case that Jesus is just the product of mythologized history and the idea that he existed is the product of reworked mythic themes that were common in the ancient Near East? Well, these are some of the claims that we've been hearing of late. We've seen some of these books come out. We're talking about one in particular called Nailed by atheist activist David Fitzgerald, my guest, Dr. James White from Alpha and Omega Ministries. So one of the things I've read that some of these books have in common that question uh, whether or not Jesus existed, and I want to get into the details on those arguments, are the names uh, Robert Carrier and Robert Price. <laughs> now, who are these guys? <clears throat> Robert Price is a nice guy. Uh, I debated Bob Price uh, at the CRI National Convention in 2010. And I spent, uh, well, again, uh, hours and hours and hours listening to his debates, listening to his lectures. He's a radical, radical, radical. You ready for this? Are you sitting down? I'm sitting down. You're sitting down. He's an Episcopalian atheist. That sounds I, about right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. He goes to an Episcopalian church as an atheist. Um, he, uh, he's just uh, very, very unique, a nice guy. Generally, when people debate him, they dismiss him by simply saying, nobody believes that you believe, because he is absolutely alone in what he believes. Hmm. I chose to go a different direction. I actually studied what he believed and then argued his beliefs, and he was absolutely overjoyed um, at having someone actually respond to him, so much so that when I gave him one of my ties, I don't know if you ever noticed, but sometimes I'll, I'll make ties that tie into the subject of the debate, and oh. I was wearing this tie, that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 from Codex Sinaiticus, the first few verses, which he says comes from like the second century or something like that, which is a completely radical perspective. Hmm. But it's a beautiful tie, mate. So I gave him one, and right there during the middle of the debate, during his comments, he's taking his tie off and putting the tie I gave him on. So he's a, he's a nice guy, but he is way out there in the ozone layer as far as his perspective goes. And Richard Carrier is in the exact same position. He's not quite as far out as, uh, as, uh, as Dr. Price is, but they're both radical mythers. And if you look at the primary sources used and nailed, it's Price, Carrier, and Zindler. And Zindler, of course, uh, is the atheist. I use his debate with William Lane Craig from Moody from years and years ago as a as my prime example of the evidentiary uh, perspective in doing Christian apologetics and contrast that with uh, the Bonds and Stein debate. So his, all his sources are from this sm very small little uh, group of, of mythers, all of whom have completely different takes. That's what's funny. Hmm. None of them are saying the same thing. They have very, very unique uh, takes. And, of course, hearing him quoting, every once in a while I could 
In fact, one of the complaints I was going to make was I'd like my 599 back because I could have summarized carrier and price better than this guy did, <laughs> which is all this book really is. Yeah. Uh, but having really delved into price especially, I could detect when he was doing things like saying that, well, you know, uh, some of these early church fathers like Ignatius, stuff like that, they're not as early as we thought they were because uh, price pushes them way back much, much, much farther uh, literally, when you when you take the phrase in First Corinthians 15, that section, uh, for I delivered you was also uh, passed on to me that Christ died for our sins, according to scriptures, and so on and so forth. When you take that, which even liberal scholars, liberal Christian scholars, would say comes within the very first generation of the Christian church, some some have said within months of the of the resurrection, um, and push that into like the 140s and 150s more than a century later, mm -hmm. that's radical. That's really, really radical. The problem is, of course, for most of the, of the people in our audience, how many even know, you know anything about the, the background of this time period right. so as to be able to push back on something like this? And that's so, right. And, and you, I'm sure you noticed that all the way through the book, uh, it was historian Richard Carrier, yes. historian Robert Price. But then when he'd talk about any Christian, it's an apologist or it's a <laughs> preacher or... You know, uh, it, it was it was it was chuckle worthy if it if if it wasn't for the fact that this is the kind of stuff that gets passed around on college campuses oh. and uh, ends up being cited and being assigned as reading and and all the rest of this stuff when it is uh, on any meaningful level just utterly laughable. No, that's true. And in fact, I have one of the quotes where he says, "Not a single historian mentions the resurrection until the third or fourth centuries, and then it's only Christian historians." But right. I, I, the claim here, and, and I'm going through some of the some of the claims here, the myths uh, that Fitzgerald puts forth in his book, Nailed. And some of these, I mean, he just basically says, doesn't matter what the gospel say, because the gospel writers plagiarized each other. Right. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter about these Josephus and some of these early historians, because they didn't really say that much about Jesus. I mean, what would you say, or what have Carrier and Price, for example, put forward as their strongest argument uh, that needs to be debunked that Jesus was a myth? Well strongest arguments. Uh, again, it goes back to historiography. I mean, Bart Ehrman, who is, I would say, the, the strongest critic in the English language of New Testament Christianity, laughs at the mythers um, because he recognizes that by any meaningful historical uh, standards, the evidence for the existence of a man named Jesus is incredibly strong. And the reason for that is, well, let's use some of the, the standard arguments. Well, uh, for example, in Nailed, it said, well, we don't have any physical evidence of Jesus' existence. Think about that for just a moment. We do not have physical evidence of the existence of 99.99999% of all human beings who've ever lived, right, right. Uh, especially uh, at that particular period of time. And yet, in the same book, I'm sure you caught this, when he got into the later myths, he turned that around and said, well, Christianity was just this little thing. It was, it was very, very small. It was, it was tiny. So at the beginning of the book, everybody should have known about Jesus because it was so big and it was so – everybody knew about it. And then he gets to the end of the book, and actually it was just this tiny little movement, and, uh, <laughs> yes. and that's why no one knew anything about it. It's like, wow, what was, was – did something happen between the writing of the beginning of the book and the end of the book? Uh, com there, there was no consistent historiography that could be applied to, to even two of these myths in a row, let alone the whole book. And unfortunately, the historiography used by Price is different than the historiography used by Carrier, yeah. which is different than that from Zindler. And so that's why they all try to carve out their own little niche and their own little audience, uh, because they have their own little, their own little pet theories. Uh, the reality is that this was not the central uh, portion of the Roman Empire. Uh, it was not a center of, uh, of commerce or culture, and hence the vast majority of the writers of this period, few as there be, um, he tried to say there were dozens, and unfortunately, you may have noticed, he sort of forgot to tell us who they were, um, <laughs> <laughs> or where they were living, or anything else. Yeah. He, he really plays on the idea that people might think that history was done in the first century the way that history is done today, hmm. or that even people looked at history in the same way that we do today. Actually, the vast majority of people living in that day outside of the uh, Jewish world looked at history as being cyclic, 
they didn't see it as being a, a continuation, a continuum with a beginning and an end and a purpose and so on and so forth. They saw it as being a cycle. Hmm. And so they had a completely different way of even looking at, at that. And, and then what we consider history, we were taught in journalism class or something like that, which, well, okay, back when I was... <laughs> Back when I was young, it was taught in journalism class. Evidently, it's not taught in journalism class anymore. Yep. But, but the idea of just reporting uh, facts and, and doing so in an unbiased fashion, that is a very, very, very modern idea. <laughs> the idea of, well, you know, if you don't have it on, on tape, uh, to use, again, a dated uh, phrase, yes. uh, but if you don't have it in MP3, you don't have it uh, in video recorded on your, on your iPhone or something like that, then it's, then it's, it's questionable that's obviously a very, very, very modern uh, concept. And so if we go, if we, if we assume that the people we're talking to are going to buy into that modern idea of how you do reporting and things like that, and then transport that back into the, into the past, well, it doesn't work past about 1950. Hmm. Um, and so people struggle to understand how history was done in the past, and then recognize that the sources, therefore, that history presents to us um, have to be handled in, in a different way. And unfortunately, um, the author of Nailed has no earthly concept no. now, of, here, of that. One, one of the things he talks about is he says the first century was one of the best documented periods in ancient history. And then he says there were all kinds of things in the Bible that weren't noted other places by people like Josephus or Tacitus or people like that. Things such as Caesar taxing the whole world or Herod's slaughter of the innocents or Jesus, as he calls it, famous ministry or right. his trial and crucifixion. How do you account for the fact that, you know, at least the stuff about Caesar and Herod were not in the writings of some of these early historians? Or well, well, Josephus... Uh... Is he gets a, a chapter into himself, uh, a chapter uh, myth number three in, in, in the book, and he has to work very hard at trying to get rid of the testimonium flavium and so on and so forth. But uh, Josephus is really the only historian of that time period in that area that we have to work with. I mean, uh, he, he tries to bring Philo in, but Philo really wasn't trying to write an entire type of, of history or things like that, and he's not. Uh, there's there's a couple other people he brings in, but the idea that this was a highly documented area, or that the histories that exist existed in the unbiased, we're just going to document um, everything that happened type mentality. That's not that's not what Pliny was doing. That's mm. not what Tacitus was doing. Uh, they're not recording history the way that modern people do. Interesting. Now it's interesting that the issue with Josephus and the census. Um, I just read a lengthy uh, paper just a couple months ago uh, that really went after Josephus and presented the thesis that, uh, well, first of all, Josephus was not infallible himself, obviously. Right. Um, and, of course, this book just assumes that Luke slavishly followed Josephus at times and then messed everything up that he quoted from Josephus somehow. Uh, isn't it funny how all the biblical authors are complete loons? Yeah, I mean, of course. They're just, they're just <laughs> <laughs> just incapable of tying their shoes, let alone getting history right. right. Uh, but uh, that's the sort of common from atheists. But um, but the but the this paper basically made a strong argument that in other areas where we have actually found Josephus to be wrong, it was in the very same kind of thing in the setting of dates in regards to governmental actions that he was wrong in those areas, and so he may have had access to some bad, uh, you know, not so much research, but information he was reliant upon. And it was a very interesting paper basically saying that there's a good reason for, or take, for taking Luke's word uh, over Josephus's at this particular point, because literally that's what you've got, is you've got the two sources. Uh, you don't have anything else. There's, there's nothing else to bring in. And then the argument from silence becomes the primary thing as well. You know, they, they, something like this that happened, somebody would have mentioned it. Right. And the reality is if you apply that uh, to any type of secular history and say, okay, if we, if we will not say something actually happened until we get two corroborating sources that are completely independent from one another, we wouldn't know anything about what happened in history. Hmm. Nothing at all. We would, we would not, that kind of standard. And that's, what's, that's one of the reasons I've, I've, uh, a lot of people have criticized, for example, Bart Ehrman in the past. Is he's become sort of uh, radical on some of those things in textual criticism. If you don't have 10 copies of the Gospel of Mark within this time, time period, yep. that kind of uh, thing just doesn't work for anything in history. Yep. Hang on. We're going to come back with Dr. James White. Don't go away.
All right, so how do we know if these so-called historians and or scholars who are claiming that Jesus is a myth actually are wrong. This is the question we're addressing with Dr. James White from Alpha and Omega Ministries. We're talking about some of these books that have come out in recent years claiming that, oh, Jesus really wasn't real. And if you just look at all the evidence, it's overwhelming. Now, yeah, it's interesting. This book nailed uh, Dr. White makes a lot of these, you know, talks about these so-called myths. And uh, I mentioned before, he says the gospel writers plagiarized each other and Luke yep. plagiarized uh, Josephus and Luke plagiarized Mark and Matthew plagiarized Mark. How do you deal with some of these? If you just had an atheist come up to you and say, Jesus was obviously a myth, how would you begin to refute that? Well, you know, there's two questions there. And I, and I think uh, one of one response and it all, all depends on how much time you have, obviously, as to how in-depth you're going to be able to uh, to get. But the thing that you were just mentioning, I think, for most of the folks in our audience, as far as Christians is concerned, is, is where we can both deepen our own Christian commitment, our knowledge of the Bible, and at the same time help prepare ourselves to deal with these issues, is to know something about the history of the Gospels and their relationship to one another, because that really was an area that uh, he focused upon, and, and that's not just an area that uh, atheists focus upon. But interestingly enough, uh, my Muslim friends spend a great deal of time focusing mm-hmm. upon alleged contradictions between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I think I've mentioned before that for the past nine years, while uh, when I teach the adult Bible study class at, at church, which means I'm not preaching and I'm not someplace out of the country somewhere, uh, that's why it's taken nine years. We've been going through the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I've been throwing John in just for the fun of it. So we're we're covering all of the, all the Gospels basically for nearly a decade, and we're doing it in the parallel form. We're using a synopsis of the Gospels so that you're forced to deal with the fact that Matthew is not a photocopy of Mark, and Mark is not a photocopy of Luke, and Luke's not a photocopy of Matthew, and that there are differences between them. And, and in fact, uh, we're going into the Passion narratives now. And uh, just this past Sunday morning, I was noting the different, em- the different emphasis uh, that is placed just in a, a, a brief description between Mark and Matthew, and why, given their audiences and the differences we've already noted between those Gospels, why would there be the, the difference that, that existed? And so I think it is vitally important. I, I mean, we, we may laugh at Nailed because it needs to be laughed at. It's just that bad. But... Uh, at the same time, the reason this kind of stuff uh, can gain traction is because it's easier for us in most of our churches to not do the type of, of work that we need to do to be real students of the Word and to, uh, for example, be able to uh, deal with uh, Jairus' daughter, for example. Yeah. If, you, if you look at Matthew and Mark's recording of that, there's a big difference. Mark has a much longer story. There are people that come and, uh, in the middle of the story and tell uh, Jairus that his daughter's died, and that's not in Matthew. And, and uh, you know, what are all these, what are these differences about? Well, by really digging in there, it can be a little uncomfortable. It can actually require work. Uh, but we can, we can come to understand things like telescoping and the fact that Matthew is, is shrinking the story down and as such, uh, he, he, he telescopes things. He, he puts things together and moves the, the story along. We all do that. I mean, uh, you, can, you might have a coworker who asks you uh, a question about how your day went, and you're not really all that fond of that particular coworker, and so they're given a fairly brief summary of the relevant points, and you get home and start talking to your husband, your wife, and they're going to hopefully get a, a significantly uh, fuller accounting. Yeah. That doesn't mean you're lying to the first person or lying to the second person. It's just a recognition uh, that an author especially has to be able to determine. Uh, you know, when I write a book, Bethany House says, uh, could you keep it under, you know, about this many hundreds of pages? <laughs> you know, we know your tendency, so could you do this? You know, and so there's stuff I have to leave out. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and does that mean I'm, I'm lying if I had to said it in a fuller way at another time? Uh, or if I, if I summarize something I said in a mosque and don't give every single word? Well, that's, that's the kind of differences you have between the Gospels. And if we don't recognize that each of the Gospel writers had an audience, a purpose, a background, et cetera, et cetera, and a limitation as to how long they wanted their book to be, then we'll fall into uh, a trap of frequently defending 
uh, assertions, and this is what happens in Nailed all the time, yep. is he, pre- he, he wants to force Christians into defending a position that we don't need to be defending. And I've seen this happen, and it's painful to watch this happen because someone thinks they're actually defending biblical inerrancy or inspiration or something when the reality is they've, they've allowed the other side to paint them into a corner, and because they really didn't know what the background was, uh, they end up in a, in a world of hurt. That's a really good point. Well, we're going to come back, Dr. James White, with me talking about whether or not Jesus was a myth. We'll return on the Janet Mefford Show after this. that we have a growing number of legitimate scholars believing there never was a Jesus. Well, one of the books that makes this case is a book called Nailed, 10 Christian Myths that Show Jesus Never Existed at All. And some of these things have to do with archaeology and history and eyewitnesses and these sorts of things. And Dr. James White is helping us unpack this. Now, one of the things I thought was interesting in Fitzgerald's book is he says, for example, the uh, setting of the Gospels is an idealized Never Never Land version of Galilee. And he goes on to say, you may remember this part, he, he goes on to say Mark must have been inspired by Homer's Iliad and or Odyssey because Jesus was traveling by sea so much and uh, Mark must have invented the Sea of Galilee. Uh, at that point, he just lost me. Yeah, well, that's because there is a uh, there is a book. I don't have it here in the in the studio right now, but uh, and he does make reference to it. I heard the footnote go by at some point, um, and that's what was what was making me chuckle is that there's an entire book out there that says Mark is mythology based upon trying to parallel Homer. Well, the, the, as soon as I heard that, I knew exactly which book he was talking about. But it's like, no, wait a minute. Which conspiracy theory are we going to go for here? <laughs> Either they're plagiarizing each other and they're making something up to try and impress this group, or it's it's going to be this trying to do Homer thing, but he's got them all going at once. He, sure. he goes for the trifecta, you know, and, and that's when you really know someone's reaching big time yeah. is when they start trying to pull together way too many conspiracy theories uh, to make any of this work. And I ran into that when I debated Dan Barker. Uh, the second time um, in the debate where he objected my quoting from his own book, which he was selling in the <laughs> lobby of the church at the time. Um, oh, <laughs> it, man. It still, still makes me go, really? But, uh, yeah, he used that same type of thing that Mark was trying to parallel Homer and, and, and stuff like this. And when once you start reading books like that or all the stuff about, oh, this is all just a remake of the pagan mythologies, the dying and rising God stuff, you know you're not dealing with someone who's actually uh, – serious about dealing with the information. It's as popular as that is. Once you actually start looking into Dionysus or, or Isis, the old, the ancient Isis, not the modern one, um, <laughs> the, uh, you, you know, and, and all the, the Egyptian religions and the Greek religions, and trying to make a parallel to Jesus, and then asking the questions, do you really think that someone was trying to impress the Jews? by making up stories like this and drawing from paganism? I yeah, mean, true, really? True, true. But unfortunately, um, uh, with, with, with serious Christianity being, in essence, kicked off of our college and university campuses, uh, the full-scale assault by the secularists uh, against the faith is well underway. And um, I just don't know, you know how long... Uh, I, just, I just hope the Internet stays as wild and free as it is, because yep. it may be in the very corners of that uh, wild, free area that we're able to continue to do the things that we do. That's a great point. I, and, you know, he has so many, you're right, he just kind of throws everything but the kitchen sink, yep. hoping that everything will stick, and yep. everything is just, uh, as long as it's not what the Bible says, then we've got to throw it into the mix. Oh, yeah, no, and it doesn't matter if, if you start utilizing theories and perspectives that are completely contradictory to the ones you were using in the previous myth that you were talking about. Yeah. That doesn't matter, and that's why I say there's no consistent historiography here here at all, which makes it very, very difficult to deal with this kind of thing. But you and I have both dealt with people who will grab hold of something like this and say, look, this is it. I, this, this has convinced me. And we have to uh, get the, the message across to believers 
that if you think it's up to you to convince somebody who gloms onto this stuff and, and grabs onto this and says, see, I'm not going to listen to anything else you have to say because of this. We become frustrated. We know how bad it is. That can be very discouraging to us. But we've just got to recognize, first of all, it's not up to us to change hearts and minds. We can't. Yeah. And secondly, we are called to be salt and light. We are not called to climb to people's brains and, uh, and, and somehow change the way that they're thinking. And we are not being, uh, we're not being failures when people grab hold of stuff like this, because we're living in a land that is clearly under the judgment of God. Um, we can't help but read Romans 1 and hear stuff about uh, about the, the darkening of the minds. I mean, I know you've already uh, read the decisions that came down recently uh, in regards to, to marriage and stuff, and the just the wild-eyed ethical and moral chaos yeah. that is being uh, pronounced by people. It, we, will, we will become a very discouraged people if we think that somehow this is a failure on our part. I hate when people blame the church. Thank well, you. Depends, Thank I, you. It, it depends, on, depends on what you're calling the church here. Okay, let's, I, yeah. I have a fairly biblical definition of what that is. But, but everyone's running around saying, well, if the church had done this, if the church yes. had done that. Yes. And, I, and I'm just like, seriously? Thank you. Have, have you noticed the collapse of the Roman Empire? I <laughs> know. I, I, get frust- I get frustrated with that same thing. I said that it's not that there aren't certain things to which you could point to the church and say we could have done that better we should have done that better but i am personally responsible for the collapse of western civilization yeah. it's a little much uh, just a little bit much and we just we just need to recognize that that our role is to speak the truth and it's not up to us how the world responds to that truth i mean i was just just on facebook i've actually believe it or not i'm only about eight years late to the party but i actually started doing more Facebook recently. And um, now I know what's going on in my kid's life. It's great. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> I see my granddaughter more often that oh. way. But, uh, but I, there was, I saw someone mention something about uh, the, the Chick-fil-A founders passing. Yes. And I saw the most vile bigotry yep. being spewed by atheists and secular activists and so on and so forth. And I, I, I made the mistake of commenting, and oh my goodness, yeah. uh, there is there you cannot make people think rationally. No. You can't force them to do it. No, uh, but you can, uh, for the glory of Christ, think rationally yourself and speak rationally that way. And remember, you only have an audience of one. You only have to please him. And do what he calls you to do, no matter how difficult it is to do. And if you're pleasing him, then at the end of the day, uh, that's what you need to do. And if we don't, if we don't grab hold of that, we're going to become a very, very unhappy people in the society in which we live right now. I think that's really true. And I think more when I was reading this book, nailed, I kept saying I've got to just keep going back to the text, the text, the text, being able to defend the text of Scripture, the Gospels as being reliable, the historicity of of Jesus, and and I mean, we need those skills again. Oh, we need to know the word. I mean, uh, you, you heard when he. Well, I hear music, but we'll, we'll talk, if, if we can remember uh, the, the Carmen Christi, Philippians chapter 2, remember what he said about that as a great illustration of okay. why we need to know the word when we get back. We'll do that. Great, great segue. We'll be back with Dr. James White right after this. minutes before the hour, Dr. James White and I have been discussing this idea that there was never a Jesus, which is absurd on its face, but we're kind of breaking down some of these arguments and uh, so-called myths that they put out there, and we're going to jump back into Philippians 2, Dr. White. Well, yeah, he went after the Apostle Paul, and, and, and you'll hear people say, well, you know, Paul never talks about Jesus doing this, as if Paul is supposed to be repeating the Gospels that he assumes the people are already familiar with. Right. Uh, and that he's not addressing specific uh, issues, but the one that just made me uh, almost ride right off the road uh, out in Carefree, Arizona, which would have been a bit, great place to get run over by a truck or something, but uh, he's sitting there going, well, you, and actually in this, uh, in this Philippians chapter 2, the Carmen Christi, a text I've done a lot of work on, 
uh, there's, there's one French scholar who pointed out that it says that he gave to him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And that means that, that, that according to Paul, um, Jesus did not receive the name Jesus um, until he was uh, this heavenly creature. So there was no physical Jesus on earth. And I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, seriously? I, 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 it is so difficult to even respond to that kind of thing because it is so far removed from any kind of serious reading of the text in its, in its historical context, wh- who Paul was, what his relationship with the other apostles was. It's so simplistic that it only appeals to the person who's just desperately trying to find some way uh, to suppress the knowledge of God that God is clearly uh, placed within them, and uh, that's exactly what you've got going on in this world. So it's it's an amazing thing to observe. It really is. And I just say to Christians, when you encounter this stuff, just have the patience um, to to do the work that's necessary to... you, You may not be able to get to every argument, but you know, work through one real well, and you'll start getting an idea of the kind of of systemic uh, contradiction these folks are utilizing. And obviously, I think we have to think presuppositionally. They, none of them yeah. can present a meaningful uh, worldview in which to uh, ground their argumentation or anything else. Um, but it's certainly true that we as Christians are going to have to be far more invested in thinking clearly uh, to be able to continue doing what we're doing in this society because uh, the society certainly is not going to be doing much in the way of clear thinking. And bottom line, and I know just, we're just seconds away from being done here, but we don't have to worry about the fact that Jesus was real. No, I, I mean, I, I, again, uh, especially on that subject, The prejudice that is presented against the Gospels as having any kind of historical validity is the first thing you have to look at. Um, The reality is that those Gospels do give us far, far more information than the atheists want us to believe gives us about who Jesus really was and what he thought. Awesome. Well, always great to have Dr. James White with us. Check them out at AOMIN.org. And Dr. White, thanks again for being with us. Hope you can stay dry and and above the water. (laughs) Thanks a lot. (laughs) Thanks a lot for being with us. Appreciate you. All right. We thank you, too, for being with us. Hope you'll check us out over at JanetMaffer.com.